Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. I'm old enough to remember the first two terms of the Joe Obama years when uh, President Obama, back when Mr. 10 percent was just uh, in second slot, drew a red line in Syria. Oh, that's right. Wagging his finger at uh, Bashar al-Assad, looking for regime change there. Golly, whatever happened? Not much, apparently, because once it became clear that we weren't going to defend that red line, uh, there was a return to the status quo in Syria. And the status quo includes what happened last week with Iranian-backed attacks on Americans, including a contractor that was killed. National Security Council spokeshuman John Kirby was on Face the Nation. I watch Margaret Brennan interview John Kirby. I do that punishment to myself so you don't have to. Thank you. Here's it's very what John, kind of you. What John Kirby said about uh, President Biden and his reaction to those attacks. What has been happening in Syria with yeah. these attacks on U.S. forces there? We had this... Uh, deadly attack on Thursday by these Iran-aligned groups, a U.S. retaliation, and then three other known attacks on U.S. positions. President Biden said he would act if U.S. troops were under fire. Is the U.S. going to retaliate? We have acted with U.S. troops under fire. First of all, condolences. Our condolences to the family of the U.S. contractor, U.S. citizen who was killed. It's devastating news that no family uh, wants to ever get, uh, and we certainly agree with them. Uh, and we're obviously uh, hoping for a speedy recovery for those who are still suffering from the wounds. But uh, this was a this was a serious attack by these militant groups, and the president retaliated swiftly and boldly, significantly, uh, to deal with that. Um, you're right. There were some follow-up response. At least from three. at least three from uh, these militant groups. Um, uh, not a lot of damage caused, although the one uh, one service member w was injured. So uh, we're going to see where this goes. But the president in Ottawa made it very clear uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to always act to defend our troops and our facilities. And here's what's not going to change, Margaret. The mission in ISIS is not going to change. We have under a thousand troops in Syria that are going after that network, which is, while greatly diminished, still viable mm -hmm. uh, and still critical. So we're going to stay at that task. For uh, more on this, please be joined by Lieutenant Colonel Jim Carafano of the Heritage Foundation. Jim, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Man, I wish I had my coffee first. There is nothing that I like about this. There is no way to put lipstick on this. It has like anything other than a sow. First of all, the, retali the, re the retaliation thing is just utter nonsense. These are militias that are backed by the Iranians. The Iranians will fight to the last militiamen and could care less. So striking them as bold and strong is just nonsense. It's just plain whack-a-mole. So that in itself ought to, ought to be really disturbing because what this administration very clearly said is we're not going after the people that are responsible, which is the Iranians. And this comes to days after Ted Cruz just excoriated the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, saying you guys are funding both sides of the Ukraine war. You're giving billions of dollars to the Ukrainians to fight the Russians. And you're giving all kinds of sanctions relief and 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 workarounds to the Iranians to make money so they can supply the, so they can support the Russians because you want them to come back in an Iran deal. So very clearly, this administration doesn't want to get tough on Iran, and so they're putting men and women in harm's way in little Alamos in the middle of Syria um, because they don't know what else to do. It's just it's just the war. I mean, it's it's like a bad bad movie. Is, a, is a, a Iran still the leading state sponsor of terror in, in the world? Do they still hold that title? Um, they, they do. And, uh, and, and under this administration, because they, 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 they do this constant opening to Iran, you know, trying to entice them back into Iran, deal, even, as, even as it is absolutely beyond a shadow of an argument by anybody on any side, that argues that any Iran deal could prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. They continue to door that open. And when you leave that door open, it allows Iranians to continue to do nasty stuff um, because they don't really care about the Iranian people. They care about funding all their proxies and their aggressive actions. And so, for example, even, even while there's a ceasefire in Yemen, the Iranians are funneling weapons into the UPs to, for the next phase of the war in Yemen. So it just doesn't, it just doesn't end. Hmm. 
Um, I was um, taken by this uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, over the weekend, especially after uh, Austin and Milley were before uh, congressional committees talking their talk. Uh, this is from uh, retired Major General Patrick Brady and uh, a former congressman talking about essentially CRT and diversity, ec inclusion, equity in the military. This, you know, treating the military like we treat um, kindergarten classrooms in America, basically, these days. They write, the cultural shift, what's happening in the military, the cultural shift isn't obvious to those outside the military, in part because it isn't immediately measurable. The harm of this CRT die identitarian instruction, the harm becomes clear only when a unit is subjected to stress and performs less effectively, and then only if an observer is there and knows what to look for. Is that, uh, is that right? I mean, is that your understanding that there have already been sort of looking at, sort of, I guess, ways to measure unit cohesion, thus effectiveness, and you're seeing this uh, focus on being color conscious rather than color blind and being inclusive and worrying about people's pronouns and gender identities is, is demonstrably making our military less effective? Yeah, it, you know, I think the good analogy is it's like a cancer. You know, at some point it metastasizes and it becomes oh so apparent that you're that you're sick and dying, but just a couple of weeks before you look, I kind of looked okay. So I think what they describe is is really accurate, and it reminds me so much of what we experienced in the late '60s and early 1970s when I was commissioned in the military, where we had the the creeping careerism of of Vietnam and so many officers just wanting to you know. Okay, you want just check a block how many how many body counts do you want okay let me write that down what do you want me to tell you the success thing sure and you know when i went into the military i had a pledge for zero defects in other words i had to sign a pledge that said i would make sure that nothing ever goes wrong i mean it was the height of hypocrisy and stupidity. of course everybody knew that was signing these things yeah, this is ridiculous couldn't even come close to doing that and and of course you know, Ronald Reagan came in the 80s, and we, we cut all that stuff out. But I I think this is a very, very serious problem. And it's and people say, oh, you know, it's a couple million dollars. Oh, well, they said billions. Who cares? But it, but it is the time, the energy that you're doing this. And it's not just the military. It's the entire federal government. This administration is adding a, a assessments to, to every single personnel review in every federal agency that says, how good are you at, at diversity, equity, inclusion? What fuzzy things are you doing to make sure that, you know, everybody – and you know what's going to – that is going to turn into complete corruption because there are no clear and open standards. And, and it literally will turn into bureaucrats promoting the bureaucrats they like because they'll give them glowing DEI assessments. And it's going to encourage people to, to, tr this, to adopt this behavior to treat people as if they're a statistic and – and some kind of, rather than just evaluate people on what they contribute to the success of the mission. So this is interesting. The success of the mission is now one of the least important attributes or things you're measured on if you are a federal employee. Uh, staying on the topic, uh, authors uh, who work at the Travis Air Force Base in California along with a, uh, a doctor who works at the Department of Pediatrics at Walter Reed, they penned a piece for the March edition of the Jour American Journal of Public Health, these three authors who are doctors in the military, asserting the need for the military to train its health care providers in how to provide minors with experimental and irreversible sex change interventions, despite acknowledging that uh, more than half of the physicians affiliated with the military in DOD, in DOD's healthcare system, report being unwilling to prescribe hormone therapy with or without training. They also suggest that uh, children as young as seven years old can make informed, can provide informed consent as to their uh, as to their medical treatment. If they want, for example, with quote unquote gender affirming uh, procedures or associated drugs. So 
they're arguing children as young as seven can make medical decisions for themselves. And then they're arguing that the entire military needs to be trained on how to provide experimental and irreversible sex change interventions, uh, DOD, DOD system wide. So that's also going on concurrent with this identitarian uh, intellectual training. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, but, but you know, people that have read the medical science and very clearly that any kind of intervention before puberty is, is not scientifically valid. And what they're actually doing is, is they're encouraging gender dysphoria. Uh, to me, as a layman, I would say, well, this is just child abuse. This is using science for a political purpose. Uh, the, there's a bigger problem here than just these Yahoo doctors. One is, you know, when you're in the military and you publish something publicly, that has to go through review. Um, why would the why would the U.S. allow doctors to be publishing uh, a journal article that that is inconsistent with medical science? And and, and not to so, not to mention the law, for example, seven year olds being able to provide informed consent. Exactly, but, but you know, the chief one of the chief medical officers in the United States government. Um, you know, supports this. This is, look, we all know, we all get the joke. This is a political agenda. Pushing transgenderism and gender dysphoria, these are, these are political things that they think that, that somehow give them some kind of special virtue. But the practical effect of this is they're committing child abuse. I mean, the, people will look back at this, at these people, and they will put them in the same category of as people that promoted eugenics in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have statues made to them. They're, they're, going to be, they're going to be criminally purged from our memories as people that were, that, were, that were maiming children because of a political ideology, not because of science. And, and people could say, well, no, that's not true. That's, we did it before. Eugenics is a perfect example of this. It's exactly the same. A bunch of people had a political agenda, and they made it sound like science, and everybody jumped on board until, one, people saw the horrific outcomes that it created, and two, they actually looked and said, oh, gee, there's no science in the science. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction to uh, last week's testimony from the CEO of TikTok before uh, <laughs> House Committee. It, did, it probably didn't go as well as he had hoped it would go, but... Um, but the larger point, though, too, is so you have all these state governments banning TikTok on state devices. You have the federal government banning TikTok on federal devices. So then um, whether you agree with it or not, then why so reticent to move into some sort of regulation of TikTok beyond the public sector? Yeah. Well, I think we saw that in the in the in the number of Democrats that jumped to the defense of TikTok. And, it, and again, it is just blatantly political it, it really wasn't any argument that no this is not a national security this is not a problem it's hey a bunch of kids are on tiktok they like tiktok i, I want to be the guy that defends tiktok that makes me cool <laughs> so again it's, it's just it's not funny it's just it's politics right it's putting politics america and america it's like you know, you know you know eating shit is bad for my child but i want to be popular with my child so I'll let them do that and then and then we complain with our children are obese and our dental bills are through the roof. I, I also want to ask you, there's a picture making the rounds of all the uh, taxpayer equipment, $7 billion in abandoned right. uh, equipment. Did, did we at least leave the keys in the car so that they could drive them? They, they don't have keys in military vehicles. <laughs> okay. Well, that's... <laughs> But I mean, I, that, that was just... No, no, it's not Obviously, like, it was a debacle, like, deadly like, withdrawal. Yeah. Do, so, like, do we have what about what about if they what if they have that um, what, what's that what was that thing to to lock your steering wheel? Oh, the the club. The, the club. No, that's the club? They're do handing they that out by the way them? at the 19th they, district in Chicago to stop car jam. Yeah, they do, and they do do that. They do change the things. But but anyway, it, this, here's the nut, the, the ridiculous demonstration. They run away from Afghanistan, where, where we're taking no casualties, and we li we're literally funding an army around us, right? Um, and, and, we're, and we're actually spending less in Afghanistan in a year than we used to spend under Obama in a week because of all the changes that, that Trump made. And, it, and we leave troops in the middle of Syria, tiny little Alamos, with literally no plan. Yeah. This, is the, this is who's running 
you know, has their hand on the wheel of government. And that's why we've restored our standing in the world uh, international community, according to what I hear from the regime, right? This is how we've done it. Uh, we've got them just right where we want them, Jim. Uh, Lieutenant yeah, Colonel, I, I, I honestly, go ahead. No, I honestly don't know anybody that, that doesn't, that won't in private admit that this administration is a complete joke. Lieutenant Colonel Jim Carafano, Heritage Foundation. Jim, thanks as always. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You've made the switch, and it feels so good.